Hey guys, Victoria Baxton here. Thanks for stopping back by my YouTube channel. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the Springfield 3. You know how we do here, we'll talk about the research and then if I was able to connect. So, hope everybody's doing great. Please excuse me. I I don't know if it's the bipolar weather or allergy season. I don't know what the hell's going on, y'all, but I'm struggling. So, I have a headache and I'm just trying to get through this before I take any medicine or kill over. So, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, guys, here we go. <clears throat> So the Springfield 3 refers to an unsolved missing persons case that started June 7th of 1992 when friend Suzanne, who went by Susie Streeter, Stacy McCall, and Streeter's mom, Cheryl Levitt, went missing from Levitt's home in Springfield, Missouri. If I mispronunciated their names, I apologize, you guys. Okay, so all of their personal belongings, including their cars and purses, were left behind. Okay. So all their personal belongings, including their cars and purses, were left behind. There were no signs of a struggle, except on the front porch, there was a broken porch light globe, okay? There was also a message on the answer machine that police believe might have provided a clue about the disappearances, but it was inadvertently erased. You heard that right. You are not going to believe. Like, it, this is just so sad, okay? Okay, so... Cheryl Elizabeth Levitt was 47 years old at the time of her disappearance. She was 5 foot tall, 110 pounds, with short, light blonde hair, brown eyes, and pierced ears. She was a cosmetologist at a local salon and was a single mother and was extremely close to her daughter, Suzanne Elizabeth Streeter. goes by Susie. Susie was 19 years old, 5 foot 2 inches tall, and 102 pounds with shoulder length, blonde hair, and brown eyes. She had a scar on her upper right forearm, a small mole on the left corner of her mouth, and pierced ears. Her left ear was pierced twice. Stacy Kathleen McCall was 18, 5 foot 3 inches tall and 120 pounds with long dark blonde hair and bright colored eyes. Streeter and McCall graduated from Kickapoo High School on June 6th of 1992. They were last seen at around 2 a.m. on June the 7th when they were leaving the last of the few graduation parties that it, they had attended that evening. At some point during the night, they were also seen in Battlefield. The pair planned to spend the night at their friend Janelle Kirby's house, but when they decided Kirby's house was too crowded, they instead, instead left to go back to Streeter's house at 1717 East Delmar Street to retire for the evening. It was assumed that they arrived because their clothing, jewelry, purses, and vehicle, vehicles were all present at the house the next day. Levitt was last heard from at approximately <laughs> Do you hear that? The helicopters. <laughs> you guys. There have been so many helicopters in the DC area lately. And I'm talking military, not just like news copters or medical. I'm talking like military helicopters, y'all. It's crazy. <sighs> Something's about to happen. Anyway, let's get on. Um, it was assumed... No, I already, already read that. <laughs> Levitt was last heard from at approximately 11.15 p.m. on June 6 when she spoke with a friend on the phone about a painting an armoire. The alleged timeline of the three is suspected to be convoluted as the friends who last saw the girls the previous evening were also the first to arrive at the Levitt house the next day. The following morning at around 9 a.m., Kirby and her boyfriend visited the house after Streeter and McCall failed to show up at her home. They had planned to spend the day at a water park, and they were supposed to leave from Kirby's house. So remember, they were going to stay at Kirby's house, but it was too crowded. And then they didn't show up the next morning. So, you know, the friends were like, what the heck's going on? Upon arriving, arriving, Kirby found the front door unlocked and entered the home, but found no sign of Streeter, McCall, or Levitt. Each of the women's cars were parked outside. She also reported to police that the glass lampshade on the porch light was shattered, through, shattered, though the light bulb was still intact. Okay, so 
you have your light bulb, you know, your outside lights, you have your light bulb, and then your little globe fits up around it, right? So this was on the ground broken. The light bulb was fine, okay? So, okay, Kirby's boyfriend innocently enough helped her sweep the broken glass off the porch, which police labor later determined may have destroyed possible evidence. This is a reoccurring thing in this case, and it's so sad, you know, because... Of course, when the friends arrived, they didn't think they were arriving to a house where three people had disappeared. They thought they were going to pick their friends up to go to the damn water park, right? So it's happened a lot in this case, and it's, it's, it's really sad because they probably, it probably would have already been solved. Inside the house, Kirby found Levitt and Streeter's dog, a Yorkshire Terrier, terrier named Cinnamon, aw, who appeared agitated. While inside... Kirby also answered a strange and disturbing phone call from an unidentified male who was making sexual innuendos. She hung up and immediately received another call of a sexual nature, again hanging up the phone. Several hours later, McCall's mother, Janice, also visited the house after failed attempts to reach her daughter by phone. Inside, she noticed all three women's purses were sitting on the floor of the living room and also saw her daughter's clothing neatly folded from the night before. Levitt and Streeter's cigarettes were also left inside the house. Uh, let me tell you, as a former smoker who smoked three to four packs of cigarettes faithfully a day, I would even wake up at night intentionally to smoke cigarettes. I was so damn addicted. We didn't, when you're a smoker, you don't leave your cigarettes, right? It's just like if you're a bald man, you always have your hat on, right? <laughs> you don't leave your cigarettes. So that was important. That's... Sorry, guys. I don't know how to turn my watch off right now, so I apologize for the little chiming. Okay. Janice frantically called the police from the home's telephone to report the three women missing, After and after placing the call while checking the phone's answer machine, she listened to a strange message, but it was inadvertently erased from the tape. Again, like, ugh. Police were very interested in the call and believed it may have contained a clue. They also did not believe they also did not believe it was connected to the prank calls that Kirby had received. Remember the sexual in nature calls. They don't think that was connected at all. That just happened to be a fluke thing. Uh, McCall's parents contacted police in reference to their daughter's disappearance from Levitt's house more than 16 hours after the women were last seen, and other worried friends and family called and visited the home the following day. Police later estimated that the crime scene had been corrupted by 10 to 20 people who had visited Levitt's house. Yeah. Upon the officer's arrival, the scene showed no signs of a struggle except for the shattered porch light. Police also noticed that Levitt's bed had been slept in. All personal property was left behind, including purses, money, car keys, cars, cigarettes, and the family dog. On December 13, 1992, a man called America's Most Wanted Hotline with information about the woman's, disappear woman's disappearance, but the call was disconnected when the switchboard operator atten attempted to link up the Springfield investigators. Police said the call had prime knowledge of the abductions and publicly appeal they appealed to the man to contact them, but he never did. Levitt and Streeter were declared legally dead in 1997. However, their case files are still officially filed under missing. Investigators received a, t received a tip that the women's bodies were buried in the foundation of the South Parking Garage at Cox Hospital. In 2007, crime reporter Kathy Baird invited Rick Noland, a mechanical engineer, to scan a corner of the parking garage with ground-penetrating radar. Norland found three anomalies roughly the same size that he said were consistent with a grave site location. Two of the anomalies were parallel and the other was perpendicular. Springfield Police Department spokesperson Lisa Cox said that the person who reported the tip provided no evidence or logical reasoning behind the theory at the time or since then. She also said the parking garage began construction in September of 1993, over a year after the woman disappeared. Digging up the area and subsequently reconstructing the structure would be extremely costly, and without any reasonable belief that the bodies could be located here, it is illogical to do so, and for those reasons, SPD does not intend to. 
Investigators have determined this lead to not be credible. So there, I, I don't know who they're talking about, but here we go. Daryl Moore, a former assistant at the Greene County Prosecutor's Office, said the tip came from someone who either claimed to be a psychic or claimed to have a dream or vision about the case. <sighs> so frustrating. Ugh. You know, prosecutors, district attorneys, police, most of them don't believe in psychics. And it's, there are a lot of fake people out there that ruin it for the real people. <laughs> okay. In 1997, Robert Craig Cox, imprisoned in Texas as a convicted kidnapper and robber and a suspect in a Florida murder, told journalists that he knew the three women had been murdered and buried and claimed their bodies would never be recovered. In 1992, Cox had been living in Springfield and when interviewed, when interviewed then, had told the investigators that he was with his girlfriend at church the morning after the women disappeared, which his girlfriend corroborated. Yeah, they never lie, right? However, she later, here we go, recanted her story and said that Cox had asked her to say that. Of course he did. Cox also stated that he was at the home of his parents the night of the disappearance, and they confirmed that alibi. Authorities were uncertain if Cox was involved in the case or if he was seeking recognition for the alleged murders by, by issuing false statements. Cox stated to authorities and journalists he would disclose what happened to the three women after his mother died. So I woke up from a dream on a Sunday morning and I saw a man at the front door of this house and he immediately took the globe and went up and he was going to unscrew the light bulb and he dropped the globe. Globe shatters. Okay, probably see where I'm going with this. Okay, so I see this pretty blonde woman opening up the door. Apparently, the noise, you know, had caught her attention. She opens up the door, and the guy's like, I am so sorry. That was an accident. I just broke your globe. I must have hit it or something. I'm so sorry. And she was like, oh, no problem. Come on in. She obviously knew the guy. Okay, she knew this man. He walks in. Um, he said, oh, are, are you here by yourself? And she was like, no, no, no. My daughter and her friend are in the other room. She was like, hey, do you want a drink? And he was like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. So she turns around to go get him a drink, and he comes up behind her, um, puts his hand over her mouth, and, like, gets her like this, like, kind of like in a chokehold. He proceeds to tape her mouth, um, pulls a roll of tape out of his back pocket, tapes her mouth, her hands, and her feet, walks her, drags her outside. I don't see him for a little while. He comes back in. Okay, so then I see him again. He comes in the house and he goes into the daughter's room and he goes to kind of arouse her while he's putting the um, tape over her mouth and kind of wakes her up. And you can you can tell she's like, what the heck? So I think maybe she knew him. Um, he proceeded to bind her hands and her feet and he carries her and disappears, comes back in goes to the other girl to do the same thing. And her eyes were so wide, like I don't think she knew who he was, okay? So that's interesting because I think the mother and daughter knew him. So he had been around them before. But the friend, no. Fast forward and there, the three women are in the back of the van. Um, it's It looks like a maybe a cargo van because there's like no seats in the back. Um, there's like two big, huge, well, two big, huge, like they look like five gallon buckets with lids on them sitting back there. Um, and then like a cardboard box with some stuff in it, but I can't really see what's in the box. And then three women are just like laying there. He proceeds to go over and, um, one of them, the daughter. And so I got, I got the feeling that he ended up doing that to all three of them. Um, and then I woke up. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so let me say this. Okay. The mother and daughter knew him. They clearly knew him. 
um, you know, to the point where the mother was fine with the fact that he had just broken her, <coughs> the globe to her front door. You know, she openly, willingly invites him in. She asks him if he wants a drink, and then she goes to get him a drink. It's not like he said, oh, yeah, I want a whiskey sour. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like she knew him well enough that she had gotten him a drink before. I don't know if, if she was going to get him alcohol or just a soda. But she knew him well enough to know what he wanted to drink. You know what I mean? Like, she didn't even ask. So that says a lot. So, and the daughter appeared to recognize him as well. Okay, the friend, the daughter's friend, did not appear to recognize him. Um, her eyes were wide. She was scared to death. Uh, so I do believe that has something to do with it. I also believe he had access to, like, a box van, like, you know, like a work van. It was an older van. Um, being inside of it, I didn't see the outside of it. I saw the inside of it. Um, it was clearly an older van, okay? I could see, like, the front seats, um, and I'm talking like, excuse me, it was probably from the late seventies to the middle of eighties. Like the seats were older style. Like you could tell, you know what I mean? So whoever this was either owned or had access to, um, a work type van. There were no seats in the back. It's one of those vans that, I don't know if you've seen them before, but like if you're a painter or an electrician, you would have shelving in the back and all your stuff would be on the shelving it was one of those type of vans so like a work van um i don't know um if their bodies are buried in that hospital parking garage um i didn't get confirmation either way of that you know what i mean um i wasn't able to connect the women i tried trust me i tried several times um but I don't think this, what is it, Robert Cox or Cox, his last name's Cox. I don't, I'm not getting that he's involved. Um, yeah, Robert Craig Cox. I don't feel that he's involved at all. I don't think he had anything to do with this. I think when he was running his mouth and being a moron talking about it, I think he was just trying to get attention. He has nothing to do with this as far as I'm concerned. Um... But there is some other scumbag out there, okay? I was able to see the guy clearly. So, <laughs> sorry guys. He was 5'10", maybe 6 foot. Um, had a little bit of a belly on him. Um, had a, like he was thicker from like, from like his midsection down, he was a little thicker, but he wasn't like a big guy. So, you know, maybe he weighed 180 pounds. Um, he had a beard, a uh, brown beard. He had um, like maybe chestnut brown hair. Um, and it was really thinning. And he had it like in a uh, kind of like a crew cut type of cut but a little longer it wasn't like you know this long it was like probably that long and he was definitely balding up here and his hairline like he's you know losing his hair right here and his hairline went like way back like where I, wait the other side where I have this big bald spot his went like way back like back to here um he yeah definitely had a bushy beard not a long beard but just like a full beard um brown eyes I believe I, they look brown but they almost look like like my husband has like hazel eyes but they kind of change sometimes you look at them and they're green sometimes they're like brown and his eyes are kind of like that okay they look brown but I think they kind of change you know at some points um pretty thick eyebrows um yeah I mean look like he he just looked like, you know, a guy who does some kind of physical job and, you know, a white guy, by the way. Um, but I, yeah, I, I wish I knew this guy's name. I tried. Trust me. I tried to get a name. Um, but, yeah, the sad reality is um, I, they're dead. I hate to say that, but they are. 
you know, I don't like to say that. And I always say, oh, I pray I'm wrong. But I think I'm pretty sure they're dead. Like, I, I know they're dead, you know? <sighs> yeah, guys. Um, that's just so, you know, you know how hard it is to make three people disappear. You know what I mean? Like, I can't even imagine, not that I've done it, but I can't even imagine, like, trying to make one person disappear, you know? But to make three people disappear, like, I, I don't even, I don't get it. I don't get it, y'all. Um, yeah. Be nice, be kind, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, hopefully, all these viruses will go away. <sighs> yeah. Check on your neighbors, especially your elderly neighbors. And if you're in a position to help somebody out, if you see a homeless person, go buy them a soda or a bottle of water or a cup of coffee and say hi to them. Um, you know, you could be that one person that makes a huge difference in that person's life. You know what I mean? And it's not that hard. It's a simple task, right? So that about does it for me.